Thank you. Yeah, I want to, start, want to start with the sound check, things like feedback. Is that all right? Anybody in the back not hearing? Okay. I've uh, been opportune, had the opportunity to come and speak at the invitation of the organizers of this meeting, for which I thank them a great deal. I wanted to also uh, find out who my audience is. I'm talking to Dr. Marshall. She indicates that about 50-50 or 45-45 <laughs> physicians and nurses. But I'm also interested in who is not a physician or a nurse. Is there any way I could find out? And of all of you, could I find out therapies of their various kinds, chaplains? Uh, what other disciplines do we have? Social work. Social work. Chaplains, social work. Chaplains. 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 Psychology. Psychology. Terrific. Because treating pain is a multidisciplinary endeavor. Uh, anybody here has not had pain? <laughs> anybody here know anyone who's not had pain? So we're dealing with a universal phenomenon. What I will hope to do in this time, and defeating the gastropalpebral reflex that we're all subject to, that's when your stomach's full, your eyes close. Let's try our best to stay awake. I will do my best. I will not hope to entertain as well as Dr. Martin. But in keeping on track, I would not belabor the uh, point except to say that I will address issues of pain management only a little bit about the physiology of the older patient. Because surprisingly, there's not a great deal of difference except when it comes to renal function. And then Dr. Buckner did such a tremendous job of talking about the issues around terminal illness. I will only focus my message about whether it's terminal illness, whether it's just post-operative patient, everyone who has pain, looking at patient's rights and looking at quality care, deserves to have optimum pain management. I also want to make the point that I am board certified in rehabilitation medicine, it's physical medicine rehabilitation. And although I took a fellowship at NIH in clinical pain research, you do not have to be a specialist in pain management to be sensitive to the fact that patients who have pain uh, need to be asked what their comfort level is, and if it's not what it ought to be, then do something if you're the prescriber, know enough of the physiology and the management of the pharmaceuticals we have at our disposal, if you're a nurse, you're at the front line, you're frequently the one who hears what the patient's condition is first, and the therapists and others, if what you're trying to do for the patient is interfered with because they are not comfortable, then it's your duty as well to let the nurse, let the doctor know so you can begin to do something with that. If I can figure out the gizmo, up, down, page up, pick down, there we go. Purpose. We should understand that the purpose of pain management is not only to optimize pain control, it is also to minimize the side effects and the adverse outcomes of and cost related with the patient's primary diagnostic treatment endeavors, <coughs> as well as what we will be giving them to treat their pain. So there are trade-offs and risks and benefit. We want to be able to manage the side effects which are inevitable with the things that are being done to them. The other thing is, to as a rehabilitationist, as therapist, the functional abilities need to be as enhanced as much as possible, but not only the physical, but that is also the psychological sense of well-being. And the, bo the bottom line is to enhance the quality of that person's life. Again, the purpose is not to give a physiologic lecture, but only to show that there are very slight, hardly clinically significant differences between treating pain in the younger person versus the older. There is a little sus more susceptibility to the opiate side effects among the older patients. However, they are also more uh, tolerant of the uh, analgesic properties as well as to the side effects. Renal insufficiency will decrease the clearance of medications and their metabolites, which actually enhances their uh, metabolic effect. What is the extent of the problem? Uh, I sense that we're pretty much aware that pain is not optimally managed in our country, and others for that matter. And what is our emphasis? The emphasis in our healthcare system in the United States is always on the, the rescue of saving people from death. However, the $228 billion annual budget is spent on the patients who will actually be dying within that year. Whereas 1% of that budget is all that the hospice care accounts for. 
here's a statement, and my format is that if I have a, a reference that uh, you would like to, I didn't put a biblio, but down at the bottom of slides where I've taken direct source material, it's down at the footnote. It may be the ultimate paradigm shift. Physicians have always been trained to prevent death at all costs, but medicine is beginning to realize that more attention should be paid to providing compassionate end-of-life care when death is inevitable, from the Texas Medical Journal of uh, April of this year. So it's a contemporary issue. And the VA, the other partner in this meeting, uh, headlined in the uh, San Antonio Express News from February of 1999, the effort to make pain treatment a high priority in medicine isn't new. The need to improve pain treatment, my words uh, inserted, has been recognized since uh, the 1970s. The American Pain Society has urged treatment of pain as a fifth vital sign since 1995. And I believe that the Joint Commission is also going uh, very much into making sure that the pain thing is uh, well accounted for on your accreditation. I have one uh, study which is from the Clinical Journal of Pain in uh, this year about the prevalence in two long-term care facilities, one at the Duke University Medical Center Extended Stay and one at the uh, Durham Veterans Medical Center. In your handouts, which are pretty much uh, identical to what I'm showing you, the table content you will not have this meat. You'll only have the top and the bottom. For whatever reason, it didn't print out um, on the handout. But the message is not to commit this to memory, but to just know that there are a couple take-home points here. One is the pervasive preference, uh, prevalence of some sort of a pain complaint among the VA nursing home people and the community nursing home uh, population <coughs> of the, uh, the Duke institution. And this is how long most of them have been carrying that pain around, uh, over six months for a great, great far majority of them. How bad is it? Intensity on a zero to ten scale, it's highly variable with this plus or minus 2.5, but on a scale of zero to ten, ten being the worst ever and zero being none at all, they're at least in the, the mid-moderate range of discomfort. And for this population, the older population, we're looking at the lower body mostly, legs, hips, back, but then multiple sites, all the pain all over. That's uh, a high percentage of respondents. This is a, a statement I believe was Mr. Coronado mentioned this morning. This is the source of Gallup Institute poll, a national survey on spiritual beliefs at the, uh, at the dying process, that more than 70% of individuals sur surveyed feared that dying in pain or alone without the ability to say goodbye was very much on their mind. Another objective will be to try to define terms which can be very confusing. This one is by consensus the International Association for the Study of Pain, uh, Dr. Harold Mursky. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Pain is a signal and it's not something that we can reach out and touch. We have to understand that the patient is telling us there is something that is very seriously wrong in their perception and it's described in terms of pain. It's always subjective. So the clinician must use the self-report of the patient as a starting point. Uh, Mr. Coronado was uh, mentioning about the definition of palliation from the World Health Organization. It's the act of total care of patients whose disease is not responsive to curative treatment. He also mentioned that it consists of appropriate, humane, and compassionate care. I emphasize the multidisciplinary nature of taking care of these patients, and we have a population of attendance here that reflects that. People have used these terms erroneously interchangeably. Uh, they are not synonyms for each other. A very specific definition for tolerance, physical dependence, and psychological dependence, which is addiction, Many people think that the physical dependence, which is physiologic, is a psychological addiction, but it is not. And then pseudo-addiction is another problem that you can run into. Tolerance basically is just saying that as a person's pain has been managed at a certain level of opiate analgesia, there will come a time when that level of opiate level uh, dosage will not be adequate, the disease hasn't changed, but the patient's becoming physiologically tolerant. The opiate receptors in their nervous system 
are adapting down to the amount of opiate in their body. The tolerance effect is fortunately shown not only for the, the pain control, but it's also shown for the side effects. Over time, the patient's tendency on chronic opiates to be respiratorily depressed diminishes. Their other side effects, be it nausea, vomiting, or whatever, can also diminish. There's a tolerance to all effects of opiates. The unfortunate is that it happens with the pain relief side, but it also happens with the other things we don't want, which is fortunate. There's also no ceiling effect. There is no upper limit to how much analgesic opiate medication a patient receives. If you just look at the large dosing that some patients are on in a chronic uh, malignant uh, pain management program, if you gave that as a single dose to any other person, it would kill them. The tolerance is a profound physiologic normal effect of opiate. Physical dependence on someone who has truly been on the narcotic class, opiate class of medications for at least a week or more will be vulnerable to the emergence of a very unpleasant and dangerous withdrawal syndrome, which is a physiologic disadaptation to opiate in the system. Downward dosing of a, on a scheduled basis is the most appropriate way if you find that there's a reason why a patient's dose should be diminished. It should never be turned off cold. There has to be a taper schedule figured out based on the half-life of the medication in use. Avoid giving things that are not just pure agonists or stimulants of the opiate system. There are some that are antagonists and some that are mixed agonists and antagonists. This is probably more pharmacology than you wanted to hear about. But there is danger to giving anything that has a bit of an antagonist component to it because that would also potentially give you an unmasking of the opiate effect. If in a severe respiratory life-threatening uh, depression, the proper dilution of the naloxone should be understood, and we'll go through that later. Staying with the definitions, addiction is a psychological rather than a physical uh, situation. It's a behavior of pain medicine seeking. And it's not for pain relief, it's for other purposes of a psychological nature. What we have to be sure to do is one of the things that people themselves fear and patient family fear is that their loved one will become addicted to the pain medication they're getting even as they are older in, in the terminal stage of life. They do not need, if there's a legitimate focus of pain, they do not need to worry about a person becoming addicted. They will be physically dependent they will not be addicted. Pseudo-addiction can be due to the under-treatment of a patient or a patient whose physiology has been a new lesion developing so that there's a new source for pain or the pain or the lesion has progressed so that it takes more. This is not the same as tolerance. It is not the same as addiction. Dr. Buckner mentioned you have to take the history twice. When you start the patient on a pain program, later on, if they require more, you still have to go back and find out, is there a new source for pain or has the lesion progressed in which the pain uh, medication is no longer sufficient? Where do you start when you are confronting a patient who has pain? And in this context, it's pain at the end of life where comfort and compassion are clearly part of the palliative formula. As Dr. Buckner so eloquently stated, you have to listen and learn and believe the patient. You have to also make sure that you, uh, the physicians particularly, have gone through the workup to find if they've identified lesions that are lurking somewhere. They could be treated through various other means. He talked about the woman with the met in the spine, you direct radiation therapy to that very focused lesion. This brings me to where tips on how to discern from the history whether visceral pain is present, bone pain or somatic pain is present, and neuropathic pain, because these will be very good pointers to what kind of intervention you will use to help manage that source of pain. These are the other uh, general aspects of selecting the pain treatment. 
The other thing in general statements, we have to address the spiritual and emotional needs of not just the patient, but their support system. We have to apply all the comfort measures other than drugs, such as is the pillow hard as a rock or as mushy as a noodle? What about the pillow? What about sitting, standing, and walking time? Activity, getting the patient moving about instead of languishing in the bed. What about light? There's a photo effect of whether you feel better or worse. Look at seasonal affective disorder in the winter, how many people become bummed out. Look at temperature, humidity, is it warm, hot, and odors in institutions, does it smell antiseptic, does it smell yearning? You know, those are the kind of things you just have to take. The environment of care is important too. Alternate therapies that do have some very good NIH consensus type research to support them, uh, acupuncture, biofeedback, visual imagery, self or uh, other person induced hypnosis. Also, the sequelae of the pain, suffering, and impending death, or just illness, is to treat the depression that is most likely going to be there, but maybe masked. Sleep disturbance, you can't sleep well because you're hurt, you can't sleep well because you're depressed. Poor appetite, impaired uh, ability to move around, mobility is sacred to all of us. It's a bummer to not be able to get around where you want to, independence is key. And you may become isolated with decreased socialization. We want to try to address those things which are inevitable about treating pain. The big one, which for some reason not everyone knows about, is that constipation will happen when a patient's taking opiates. And you might as well use the uh, knowledge that this is going to be inevitable by getting them on a bowel program. There is a direct antiperistalsis effect of opiates on the gut. Patients will also, if they have poor appetite, not eating well, be getting decreased fluids and bulk fiber, which is what normally we have for uh, helping the contents move through, as well as the decreased activity and, and the immobility will again, these all conspire to lead to an inevitable complaint or finding of constipation or obstipation of the patient. Sedation is often a side effect of the treatment with uh, the stronger opiates. Nausea and vomiting can be induced through the apomorphine centers in the brainstem, pruritus or itching. Mostly these two are common with morphine sulfate. And of course, respiratory depression. When we're going to have to um, manage the patient, we should also know that the nursing quality measures are should be part of a program in your units where the bowel program to manage uh, any potential opiate effects on the gut would be taken into account. Other tips would be that the dosing regimen and route of administration is important so that you're not getting a, uh, a drug that gives you high peak serum levels and gives you your side effects in a big burst. Trying to keep a level, blood level of analgesic medication is the most proper thing to do. The choice of opiates that you use is best handled because you are going to be titrating patients upward. You're going to be going perhaps from IV to oral, oral to IV. Would be based, uh, best done by using a table or calculated dose equivalencies. It's not something that most of us or I can keep in my mind. I would prefer not to make an error and refer to a table. Also, adding an adjuvant non-opiate medication is helpful in managing side effects. Those of you who've worked in units know that naloxone is used to reverse uh, respiratory depression, but there's a very specific way it should be done. But one of these statements which I would like to say, I've had this experience, no patient has come to respiratory depression while awake. I relate when I had my appendix removed several uh, years ago as I was lying on the stretch in the recovery room after receiving the uh, so many milligrams of morphine and waiting an expected period of time and the pain wasn't any better. I asked the nurse, that wasn't really helpful, can I have some more? She said, no, it's ordered for. I said, I promise I will not stop breathing. Give me some more medication. <laughs> first, hand, first hand knowledge. Uh, the uh, side effects are less common uh, after the patient has been on the opiates for a period of time, but uh, the possibility of emerging from opiate reversal is uh, only going to be affecting those that have been on chronic opioid use rather than uh, an opiate-naive patient just beginning to take the uh, opiate. 
There is a protocol for using a reversal of opiates. This uh, it uses a dilute antagonist in small titrating, titrating doses is the approved method. Naloxone, 0.4 milligrams in a 10 milliliter saline solution, which brings the amount per milligram down to 0.04 milligram per ml. And then only a half milliliter, or 0.02 milligrams, is given every two minutes as an IV push, with your titration being to what the patient's response will be. As Anybody had to reverse this? How many times has anyone seen a bolus of the whole thing, one ampule given, uh, other than the emergency room? Okay. Uh, this, for someone who's been, again, on opiates chronically or for at least one to two weeks, it's best to do this very safely. If the patient is diving very quickly into respiratory arrest, the intubation and the ventilatory assistance should be done and then titrate down slowly as this formula indicates. There's some tips about selecting analgesics. The World Health, Health Organization has published their stepped ladder approach, but even though these steps and they're uh, inverted in step one, two, three order instead of the other way, do not have to be slavishly adhered to. When you have severe pain, you do not have to go this way and then you go to this one and this one. You jump in wherever it's required and you can mix and match the different steps. I alluded to in an earlier slide that there are certain descriptors in the patient's history that will help cue you in on where the source of the pain is located. Somatic bone pain tends to be very discreet. It's deep, aching, severe, well localized. Visceral pain, internal organs, it's deep, it's crampy, it's aching, it's gripping, it's severe, threatening. This is the most foreboding pain that anyone has is usually if there's an internal organ involved. It's ominous and it's not well, well localized. It can refer at other different places as well. Typically, the pancreas can refer to the back. Neuropathic pain is described in much more discreetly sharp or it can be burning. It's often known to be neuropathic if it follows a particular nerve root, a particular peripheral nerve distribution, or if it's a peripheral neuropathy, it's typically at the tips of the fingers or the toes. There can also be nerve invasion from a visceral uh, or a bone lesion, so it could be a mixed etiology of any three of these. Somatic bone pain typically, as Dr. Buckner's patient was told, would have the option to use radiotherapy to avoid a pathologic fracture. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, this is combining a non-pharmacologic treatment with a, a non-steroidal, what I do, okay. There we go. But besides the, the older non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that uh, have been on the block for a long time that do the job of inhibiting prostaglandin and the cyclooxygenase uh, mechanism for arachidonic acid. The new COX-2 inhibitors, Celebrex and Vioxx, may now offer us the ability to give them this very beneficial uh, analgesic non-opiate for bone pain without the GI toxicities, the gastrointestinal side effect. Opiates, being another class of medication, are very frequently used and are in fact the mainstay for very severe pain. The co-analgesic effects of the adjuvants, particularly the uh, tricyclic antidepressants, they are augmentative of opiate and non-steroidal anti-pain relief. Opiates are generally the first line for visceral, deep visceral pain. The celiac plexus block is something that our anesthesia colleagues can perform for deep abdominal lesions. Sometimes with the opiates or due to the natural disease process, an obstruction of the bowel can occur, giving great distension and pain, decompression of the GI tract. Overcoming the peristaltic uh, paralysis is often overcome by using IV uh, metoclopramide. That's regular. Nausea and vomiting can frequently be controlled by either changing the opiate to one that's less uh, emetogenic to one, uh, or just using a supplemental adjuvant such as scopolamine, hydroxyzine, this is Vistaril, it's an antihistamine, uh, or a phenothiazine such as compazine antiemetic. 
Neuropathic pain, the third of those three physiologic structures that can be giving us um, historical clues to their whereabouts, is not typically responsive to oh, uh, narcotics. And it's not particularly responsive to non or acetaminophen. But the antidepressant and the anticonvulsant classes have a great body of literature showing that diabetic neuropathy, other forms of chemotherapy-induced neuropathies are very uh, useful. And the tricyclic antidepressants, as well as the anticonvulsants, there's a new one, the uh, gabapentin is uh, particularly helpful in even the, the burning dysesthesias of various peripheral neuropathies. This is another slide that's too busy to commit to memory and it's not in your handout. I only wanted to show that there are certain uh, limits to the non steroidal anti-inflammatories. You will not see a maximum dose of an opiate. This is the ceiling effect. These medications can only be given up to certain high uh, doses per day or you begin to get into a very toxic range. I also wanted to point out in this slide that there are preparations of certain ones that if the patient cannot take an oral tablet, pill, or capsule, that there are oral <laughs> solutions easier to swallow or in, in served by tube feeding, as well as there are suppository forms, and there's also the sustained release version, not just the immediate release. <laughs> Under the opiates, in this slide you see that there's just a, a large family of these, and it's not by any means complete. This is important to uh, refer to, and I said before that when you're making a switch between an oral to a parenteral or a parenteral to an oral, there are some rough equivalencies. The oral dose of morphine is about three times that of the, the uh, oral dose. Uh, the, the oral dose is three times that of the parenteral dose for the same equianalgesic amount. For dilated hydromorphone, that's a five to one. So there's no constant factor. Each opiate has its own biological spectrum of bioavailability, uh, metabolite activity, etc., which determines what the ratio of oral to IV. So converting back and forth does require a great deal of knowledge about the opiates and their uh, interchangeable uh, dosing between uh, manners of delivery. Fentanyl is a very, uh, very useful drug because it comes as a transdermal through the skin patch that can be given. And it's IV and it's epidural. The thing is with fentanyl, it's uh, extremely potent in micro doses. Among those things which help uh, avoid side effects or treat side effects, the psychostimulants when you get sedating uh, effect, caffeine, which we all just had with our lunch, we consume greatly during the morning, and I hope you're all sipping on right now. <laughs> Methylphenidate, Ritalin, and amphetamine, speed. Bowel agents would include the use of fiber, stimulants, and surfactants. Antihistamines have some co-analgesic, they're very weak, but there are co-analgesic effects of the antihistamine class. Anticonvulsants, generally for either the seizures that may, the brain that may uh, bring on, or just that certain neuropathic pains are amenable to these interventions. Tricyclic antidepressants either as co-analgesics or to treat, in fact, the patients are typically depressed. These sedative hypnotics, not advised for routine go-to-night uh, sleeping medications, but if the patient is truly having a difficult time dealing with their, their situation, the anxiolytic effect of the benzodiazepines is very helpful. The route of administration is very important to keep in mind, and I put intramuscular injection last because it is not recommended. I had some intramuscular injections of Ketorolac, and I preferred not to have those. It's just, a, it's just such a very uncomfortable way of giving the patient something to treat their pain, and it causes muscle, muscle uh, damage. So oral is always the preferred. It's something the patient can take voluntarily. They're a little bit in control. Transdermal patch is the next most user-friendly. You just put it on and change it every so many hours. Rectal suppository is still one of the more uh, underutilized. If you have a form of drug that that's amenable to. 
subcutaneous infusion, a lot of people don't know about that, but drugs can be uh, subcutaneously infused on a continuous infusion basis or administered on a one-time dose subcutaneously. And then more uh, recent in the past uh, many years though, this uh, person, uh, pain, uh, patient controlled analgesia, PCA pump, this is very dependent on how good the formula was to set up what their interval for the bolus is, what the dose was, and when they get bailout breakthrough options. General guidelines are that we want to uh, advise that around the clock dosing is preferred over as needed or PRN. If a patient has their pain continuously or is mostly more so than not very often present, we need to titrate the dose of opiate to the effect of pain relief. That is our end point. When you're increasing a, an opiate in the patient who is not yet there, you need to give increments of about 25 to 50% of the prior dose. It's not very discernible if you just give another 5%. You must treat the adjuvants, as we've talked about, and if you're going to be crossing over from one opiate uh, medication to another, tolerance is incomplete between medications, so you don't know if you're going to go to one where the patient's more tolerable or not, so you would only go up by, uh, uh, give a 50 to 75% of the dose you actually use the table to calculate, and then bring that up quickly if it doesn't take care of it. I mentioned too, earlier on, about the use of mixed agonist and antagonist or partial agonist. These should not be given whenever the patient is on a long-term analgesic. These are examples with their generic and trade names. There's one warning about Demerol or Paradine. This medication tends to be a, a very favorite of surgeons for post-operative pain, which is fine. But in a patient who's going to need long-term pain management, do not, do not use Demerol or Paradine. Why is that? There's a metabolite from the processing of the parent compound in the body. It comes out as normaparadine. And it's a neuroexcitatory substance that can induce seizures. Also, if you're going to reverse an overdose of Demerol, normaparadine, there's more of a selective reversal of the, the sedating and pain relieving effects of the parent compound and not as much of the normaparadine, the metabolite, so that you're actually lowering the three seizure threshold because the parent compound actually suppresses the metabolite tendency. A very bad mix of uh, MAO inhibitors with meperidine, with uh, hyperpyrexia, uh, malignant uh, fever, and the renal status of patients will uh, need to be taken into account for dosing of any of these things because of the possible buildup in uh, renal insufficiency. We get to a the ethical problem of a double effect, that is that you will, I heard this mentioned by one of the speakers or maybe a, a conversation earlier, that to give the patient enough pain relief, you may be getting very close to the threshold of inducing death. The intent of what you're doing is the key thing when it comes to the medical legal issues. When you discuss things with patients, one of the things that you must discuss with them and their family is that to give that individual the most proper pain management, there may be the side effect that their death may be related, not necessarily caused. And they will have to know uh, basically that this is a possible side effect as uh, this may happen. I have a couple websites for you that will give you some more information about the uh, actually guidelines for pain management. This is the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research. There's also a National Clearinghouse for guidelines. You said, I think the talk was to give you an update on pain management. Well, pain management hasn't changed a great deal over the years, but what you can do now is get updated to the fact that you can find more out about this stuff on the internet than you ever had the opportunity to before. Uh, I think physicians particularly are able to go to Medscape and you can download various guidelines. 
American College uh, Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, my specialty, also has a, uh, a link to practice guidelines and for pain. This is one address the whole way across, but because of the hyphen it wrapped. American Academy of Pain Medicine has its site. These are societies that are um, members that are working on pain relief and uh, getting information out to uh, society. This is a, a link that is through the American Pain Society, Tolaria. The multi, the hyper uh, media assistant for cancer pain management. I'll show you a screen capture of this uh, in the next slide. Then there's also the International Association for the Study of Pain. And these all have journals too that you can subscribe to go to the library and see. This is a, a screen capture shot from my computer, saved to PowerPoint and size to fit. But on a computer, if you visit this site, which is that second one from the bottom on the prior slide, you even get a uh, dosage calculator for equal energies of conversion between opiates. This is the kind of resource we now have available as providers for our patients. And most of the patients are going to be visiting these sites anyway, so you might as well get on there yourself. <laughs> There's also a tremendous asset, as Dr. Buckner had said, he's made this little pocket uh, cheater thing, so that uh, a pocket version that's about like so that fits in a doctor's white coat is available through the American Pain Society. It's now up to the fourth edition of the principles of analgesic use in the treatment of acute pain and, chronic and cancer pain. This is another one that has a uh, alliance of cancer pain initiatives. And I think one final statement is it's time for me to wrap this up. That would be of uh, interest in keeping in mind is uh, Dr. Butler, medical editor-in-chief of geriatrics from May of this year. American medical training emphasizes aggressive treatment and heroic efforts to save lives. Death is not a defeat, as for Dr. Buckner, but rather it is the natural conclusion of the life of life and of our relationship with patients in our care. One more thing I leave with you, which is not in your slide. The AMA statement on assisted, uh, physician assisted suicide. In light of the Dr. Kevorkian recent sentence of 10 to 25 years, the AMA remains committed to assuring patients dignity and adequate relief of pain at the end of their lives. The AMA has long supported the compassionate quality care for dying patients. We will continue our efforts to teach physicians everything they should know about providing proper end-of-life care, and it's my urgent uh, desire that I have done that for you today. Thanks very much. I understand now that you have shots of about five minutes worth of questions and answers. I didn't talk. There are so many issues that. Okay, I get better to turn this off. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Perkins was talking about cultural differences. There are cultural differences in how people express their experience of pain. That's a whole other topic, but it's real. There is also the. Um, Okay, well, anyway, I'll take your questions. There's a thought there that I'll bring up. Anybody? Mm -hmm. uh, for years, I've been distressed to see that they really don't recognize alternative medicine so much in treating, such as acupuncture, tennis, hypnosis, in the medical setting. I found doctors very resistant to use it. I found that it's been very hard to get access to patients to those therapies. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to become more prevalent since it's becoming a more recognized area? I think the media. Repeat the question. Oh, okay. Uh, we do think the question is: Will alternative medicines, alternative therapies, be more brought into the mainstream uh, for this? I think there is a movement to do that. The media is certainly getting a, a lot of interest in that. Patients are more or less demanding it. However, it's it's hard to say because the American uh, Pain Society had wanted to get pain as the fifth vital sign back in, uh, well, way back, but it was stated in 1990. It's taken five years for the VA to hit the, you know, hit the splash to, so it takes time, and physicians are coming out of medical school not particularly well schooled in pain management. I don't suggest that everyone has to be an expert in pain management, but you have to at least know, hopefully, as much as I've provided, to know there is more to know about pain management 
and you may already know, and they get inquisitive to take additional information on it. Mm -hmm. I actually have two questions. Um, You're allowed. Given that pain assessment in the skilled nursing facility is definitely a problem, it's being mm -hmm. untreated, what assessment tool or is there any Let me see if I can recapture the two parts. One is uh, how we would go about trying to assess the pain level of someone, particularly when their mentation may not be enough to tell you I hurt at a 5 out of 10, a, a verbal analog skill. Or the other is um, repeat. Which opioid has less pain? Oh, I would say that if the patient is going to have to be on a chronic opiate, um, fentanyl and some of the newer uh, agents that are uh, generally short half-life that can be given uh, continuously are preferable over the longer half-life medications and the older ones. So more uh, recent, uh, like the fentanyl, would be an ideal one, I think, for an elderly patient, and particularly it's easily rapidly turned down to establish their mental status. And talking about uh, a whole thing about uh, assessing pain, this is just from the table out there from Purdue Frederick. The, the standard for research studies has typically been this 10 centimeter analog scale, visual analog scale. We ask a patient 0 to 10, 10 being the worst, that's our verbal audio, audio analog scale. But it's nice to have something in a patient's chart that's actually 10 centimeters and it's written down. You don't normally put the numbers and that sort of thing. It's just a blank line with no pain and the worst upper you know, pain imaginable. And then the patient puts a mark an arbitrary feeling of where that is without any clues. And you use that with a ruler to measure out whether your intervention moved them down towards zero or it didn't move at all. The other thing for the dementia patients or children, these smiley and frowny faces are another tool that are helpful, not just for the children, but for the elders who may not be uh, as verbal. But you know, if they have a hand that can move, a finger that can point, they can sort of point to which face most uh, is in synchrony with how they're feeling. If the patient cannot tell you in any way, shape, or form, or signal to you with eye winks and those other nonverbals, you have to then go by observation and vital signs. If they seem to be sleeping and comfortable and their vital signs is, are such, the pulse, the blood pressure, respiration, and when they're more awake, uh, what their vital signs are, but when they're awake with pain, they're going to be something else. You're going to have to use more observational data uh, and maybe a family member can tell you mother looks very uncomfortable right now or something. You have to rely on, I don't want to say veterinary medicine disparagingly, but it's almost like a veterinarian has to infer. And I think when you're connected with your patient, the inference is not too terribly hard to do. Do I have time? Any more? Is that it? Okay, well, thank you.